listening to Meet the Thriller Author, the podcast where I interview writers of mysteries, thrillers, and suspense books. I am your host, Alan Peterson, and this is episode number 86. Today's guest on the podcast is an author that really doesn't need an introduction, so I'll just go over some highlights of his amazing career. Dean Koontz is an author of many number one New York Times bestsellers and whose books are published in 38 languages and has sold over 500 million copies to date. Dean Koontz's literary career dates back to 1968 when his first novel, StarQuest, was published by Ace Books. He's had a string of bestsellers like Whispers, Strangers, Watchers, Mr. Murder, The Odd Thomas series of novels, The Night Window featuring his character Jane Hawk, and his latest is Nameless, a short story thriller collection which will be available from Amazon Original Stories in digital and audio only and for free to Prime and Kindle Unlimited members on November 12th and his next thriller novel Devoted will be published in April of 2020. It's my great pleasure to welcome to the podcast the great Dean Koontz. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me there. Um, You're such a prolific uh, writer with uh, well over 100 books published. Uh, What is your writing process and has it changed a lot since you first started? It changes almost year by year, but the the, the time frame uh, sort of remains the same. I'm up at six. I uh, some mornings at five. Uh, I shower. I walk the dog. I have breakfast at my desk, and the latest I'm working is about. If I get up at six, I'm working by seven thirty. If I get up at five, by six thirty, and I work straight through to dinner. And I almost never have lunch because lunch makes me groggy. Uh, and uh, I, uh, that, that's the time frame. The process is I never use outlines. Uh, I start with a premise and a character that intrigues me, and I run with it. So I'm always at risk of getting to the end and not knowing what the hell I'm going to do. But, in fact, it always works out. Uh, it, it's, I think it's the best process because when... When you outline, at least for me, when I outline, I lock myself into a path. And if I don't outline, then the mind is always working. And as you move through the story, you discover new paths that are more interesting than anything you would have originally conjured up. So that's the basics of my process. And I work uh, a minimum of 60 hours a week. And when I'm in the last third to a quarter of a novel, that can go up to 70 and 80 easily because the momentum gets so great then that it's just a joy to stay with it. And do you, uh, do, you do a lot of research beforehand or do you do it as you're writing it? I, I often, have, there are certain things I know when I start that I, I need to know about. So I will get all that research material ready and start reviewing it. But a lot of research occurs as it's writing because uh, when you don't know what path you're exactly going to follow, you're not going to know some of the things that are you're going to be required to learn in the, in the process. So, uh, so I, I do both, and uh, I I do a lot of my research from books, but uh, online I'm not online in my office because I do not trust myself to avoid wasting time on online pursuits. So. Uh, I have an online computer in my assistant's office, and anytime I need Google Earth or, or Google Street or anything else, I go down there and do it. So there's a barrier between me and easy online entrance. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because it's so easy to you look up one thing, next thing you know, half the day is gone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and did you always want to become a writer? And what drove you to write that first novel? It kind of always struck me as kind of odd because there were no books in our house when I was a kid. And yet by the time I was eight, I was writing stories on tablet paper and binding the edge with staples and covering the staples with tape so you wouldn't prick your finger and drawing a little cover and peddling them relatives for a nickel. And by the time I was 11, 12, 13, I was... I had been a library patron so long that I'd read everything in the children's department. And the librarian, in those days, you weren't allowed in the adult section until you were 18 or whatever. Not because it was pornography there, simply because they had a different idea then about how children matured and what they could read. But the librarian said to me, I'm going to let you in. I think I was 12 or 13. I'm going to let you in the adult section because I'd already checked out everything in the children's and the young adult sections. And, uh, but 
for years I wondered where this impetus came from, why books so much. I think there were two reasons. Books early on for me became an escape from a kind of intolerable household. My dad was a violent alcoholic. We were very poor and uh, never knew if we'd have a roof over our heads. But books allowed me that escape and also taught me there were other ways to live. And then I once realized that when I was three or four years old, uh, my mother was uh, hospitalized and then in recovery rehabilitation for about six months. And my father couldn't be trusted to take care of me. So I stayed with a friend of my mother's. And every night that woman put me to bed with a cherry ice cream soda and read a story to me. And I go back, I think, to thinking of that as the most blissful time in my childhood, uh, because there was no chaos of my father around. And I started to associate storytelling, I think, with peace. And it's probably those two things that drove me. Um, Then I started writing stories when I was, uh, seriously, when I was in college. Wow, that is so amazing, the uh, power of books. You're such a master at at blending the genres in your books. It's always just been so uh, fascinating. How did did you develop that in the beginning? And do you know that you were doing it at at first? (laughs) I've had a couple of reviewers say I invented the cross-genre novel, but uh, I don't know if I did. But I will tell you that when I started writing the novels I did at at, uh, Putnam, starting with, I guess, probably when I wrote Phantoms, little bit whispers, but certainly everything after Phantoms, there was this consternation from the publisher of, what on earth are you doing? This is a, supposed to be a suspense novel or whatever, and it's got this horror element in it, or science fiction, and then there's a love story twined through it, and then there's this. And uh, publishers, especially then, but I think still pretty much, most of them prefer that once you've written a story of one kind, you spend the rest of your life writing the same kind of story. And I just, I'm as a reader, I read in all genres, and including literary fiction, which to my mind is just another genre. And good work can be found in any of them. And uh, because I read in all those forms, I just started to write in them uh, and not be able to separate them out of every book. Some books, like The Husband or The Good Guy, are more straightforward in their suspense elements, but then you get to something like From the Corner of His Eye or Odd Thomas, and sort of all bets are off. And so now your upcoming uh, Amazon original story is uh, Nameless, and it's being published uh, digital and audio only, um, which is a collection of six short stories uh, with a vigilante for hire. Um, Why did you decide to publish this type of story collection? Well, uh, there was a period when publishers were asking you to write uh, a novelette, uh, something around 15,000 words, to support your new novel. And it would have one of the characters from the novel in it or be a little prequel to the novel or something like that, but a complete story in its own. And we, I did those for the publisher, and they sold quite well. And at one point, Amazon, this goes back a few years, came to me and said, we'd like you to write a story for Kindle just directly. And uh, I wrote a, a novel called Ricochet Joe, and uh, it did so well that we kept talking about doing um, a series of the same character, which really intrigued me because I love the novelette form of uh, some of my favorite fiction from science fiction writers like Theodore Sturgeon or uh, Heinlein or uh, uh, Bradbury. There are less Bradbury because they wrote at shorter lengths, but uh, some of my favorite stories are of that length. And I started thinking, you know, the Sherlock Holmes stories, none of them are full-length novels. They're novelettes, not to novellas. And uh, it's an intriguing form for your, you're not six months till you're at the end of the process. It can happen more quickly. Um, and it's it's demanding in a different way. So I thought about it, and I gave them the concept of Nameless, and they liked it. And I had great fun writing these six. Uh, they all range between ten and 15,000 words, so they're somewhat longer than short stories. And you put the six together, they're almost novel length. And... Uh, Fortunately, they liked them, and uh, it's. I also thought it was kind of like 
binge watching TV, here's an opportunity to binge read a series of stories featuring the same char- character. And you know, going in that they're all done, you don't have to wait any length of time for the other one. And what was the experience? Uh, was it different to writing these compared to a, a novel? It, it was different in that it's partly what expectations you set for yourself. I, uh, I wanted them to be almost like a novel in experience. I wanted uh, the color of a, a novel, that, them to be colorful, the language to be full and rich. Uh, and I wanted you to get a real good sense of the characters in them. But you have a lot less space to get that done. And uh, so that was the, the biggest challenge of them. It was finding very succinct ways to depict things and to make vivid images in the mind. And uh, the readers will tell me whether I succeeded or not. But, uh, but I have to say, I had a great deal of fun uh, writing them. And the character really intrigues me. Yeah, I was able. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get an advanced copy of of the first story, and it's uh, it's awesome. So yeah, I think it's, uh, <laughs> I think they're really going to enjoy it. And so this is going to be available for free. Nameless will be f- available free for Prime and Kindle Unlimited on members on November twelfth. And as a Prime and Kindle member, I thought that was really cool. Um, so what is your take on this Netflix type subscription model for books in the future? You know, I don't know. Uh, I. Uh, everything is changing, and when I decided I had to move on from my previous publisher, I had already written the nameless stories for uh, Amazon, but I hadn't thought about moving there for novels. And my uh, my agent said, you know, you've had such a good time working with them, and uh, they're they're very forthcoming in terms of their generosity and advance and uh, all of that kind of thing, and. Uh, uh, said, let's include them in uh, in when we go out seeking a new publisher. So we went out, broad submissions, and had seven or eight offers, and Amazon's the one I ended up taking for novels. I forget now your question. I think I was getting to it in a roundabout way. But. Well, you sort of like the whole uh, uh, binging the movies and TVs, oh, okay. and now we can binge books, too. Yeah, the subscription model, that's what yeah. you're asking, Yeah. It's, uh, I guess, almost anything works. I was a little surprised when they liked the, the concept of the name of the series and then said, uh, we don't want to pay royalties because we're going to give this away free. <laughs> and I said, oh, how does that work for me? Well, yeah. they, they, they weren't asking me to give it away free. They were paying me quite well to write them. But so it, to me, it didn't matter. It's, it's who, how many readers you get. You get in this in the first place to uh, communicate. To uh, when I backing up to what I said as a kid when I was reading books, they not only allowed me to escape a very unpleasant house, but they also taught me that life was much different outside our house. When you're a kid and you're living in that kind of environment, you tend to think that when everybody goes home and closes the doors. That's what houses are like everywhere. That's what families are like. And I was able to learn that it wasn't the case. And books helped me to cope psychologically and um, emotionally uh, with the trauma of growing up like that. And so it became an important thing when I was deciding to be a writer that you might be able to give that back to people. And it's one of the best things about fan mail is when you, you get reader letters that tell you, oh, I grew up in a house just like you did, and uh, but I had your books uh, when I was 12 and 13 and 14 to read, and they really helped. And um, uh, that's one of the most rewarding things about it. So in the end, it's however you get the readers, uh, that's what you're after in the first place. It's the communication, it's the sharing of ideas, and it's the storytelling. Do you like to binge? What do you binge on? Well, I these days, my writing schedule at my age, it surprises me, is heavier than usual. And uh, so I don't binge read particularly. I'm always reading research. And uh, once in a while, I binge read what I've read before because I know I'm going to like it. I, uh, I go back to like the... Uh, Donna Westlake wrote these noir novels, uh, Parker series, under the name uh, uh, Richard uh, oh. Stark. Sparks. Stark, yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I've recently read like five or six of those, and I can always go back and reread John D. McDonald. 
and uh, but binge watching. Um, uh, I have to wait till the whole series is available, whether that's how it's done or not. Like I love I loved Breaking Bad, and I almost equally, or maybe as much, like Better Call Saul. But I wait until the whole series is available on DVD, and then I sit down and watch it all in a day or two. And so where did you come up with the concept for Nameless? Sometimes you know where things come from, and sometimes it's a little bit of a mystery. I thought it would be interesting to have a character who uh, does has amnesia, not an uncommon feature in fiction. But I wanted it to be a different kind of amnesia. I wanted him to remember everything he's been doing for the last two years which is what you're following him doing now, but have no memory whatsoever of his previous life, except that he knows that his amnesia must have been engineered, and he suspects that he wanted it to be engineered. He wanted his memory taken away from him because of something that he can't bear to remember. And uh, and the the basic idea for the character goes back to something like that old TV show, uh, Paladin, about the Western character who rides around uh, and defending the defenseless. Uh, and in this case, uh, he has some kind of organization backing him that provides him with everything he needs just when he needs it. And that becomes a mysterious part of the story. And once I had those elements, which was probably in about 10 minutes, uh, then I thought, this can go almost anywhere you want it. And uh, I, I would almost say the first story I liked, but became my least favorite because the character evolved so as the stories moved along, and his method of handling things became more and more interesting to me. And so you also have a thriller coming out that you mentioned earlier in uh, April of 2020 uh, with Thomas and Mercer uh, called "The uh, Devoted," and um, I was reading about it, and it says you have a, a dog character named Kip. There's, Dogs have been such an important uh, role for you in your life and in your books. I was wondering how you came up with, uh, if you could tell us a little bit about Kip and how you came up with that character. Well, I, I, we work with a, an organization that provides assistance dogs for people with severe disabilities. Mostly that will be paraplegics, quadriplegics, spinal bifida children. Uh, but they've also provided them uh, for autistic children. And those assistance dogs do different things than the ones for paraplegics. And mainly they are dogs that calm um, the autistic child. And it's been fascinating to watch that in many, many cases, the presence of that dog alone is enough to stop autistic meltdowns, uh, stop the sort of stubbornness or intransigence that can happen uh, uh, at times. With, and the child becomes much calmer a lot of the problems, he's still an autistic child, of course, but the problems uh, go away, and the child, a lot of them, and the child becomes much happier. So Devoted sort of came out of the idea that there be this woman who is a very competent uh, woman uh, and an artist, and she's a widow, but she has a child who's an 11-year-old autistic who has never spoken a word in his life. And... uh, uh, there would be this dog Kip, uh, who would find who I don't want to give anything away, but Kip would be able to communicate with this boy and the boy with the dog in a way that the boy has never communicated with anyone. And there's a great threat against he and his mother that they're only gradually coming aware of in the early chapters. And I, as the book evolved in my mind, I thought the word evolution became important because I started thinking about, well, how does, why is Kip able to communicate? It means Kip is more intelligent than, than you think of dogs being, though. I kind of argue that dogs are very much more intelligent than we think, a belief that's becoming more widely accepted in, in the scientific community. And uh, their intelligence is in some ways of a different character, but, um, But I thought, uh, how are they able to communicate this boy and this dog? And this dog becomes very important as the boy and mother come under threat. And that led me to the notion that humanity and dogs have been sharing their lives for 100,000 years. And in that 100,000 years, dogs have changed. They've become, uh, they've developed a lot of human-like traits. uh, 
And uh, I thought, what if we're on the cusp, or have been for maybe a couple hundred years, of an evolutionary movement in which dogs and humans come to bond in a way that uh, that they've been preparing to do for 100,000 years? And what if there is living among us a secret community of dogs who call themselves the Mysterium because they don't know why they're different from other dogs? Uh, and Kip is one of the members of the Mysterium. Uh, and so that becomes an element of the story. And it's about that moment in human history when dogs and humans reach a new level of bonding and understanding that is kind of magical. And I had great fun with that because I got to write a great golden retriever and that's <laughs> my favorite dogs. Although there's all kinds of other dogs in the story. You, do you love golden retrievers even uh, before you started writing about them? Because Watchers is one of my favorite uh, novels and I remember Einstein fondly. <laughs> yeah, I, everybody thinks I had a golden when I wrote that, but I didn't. I, oh, wow. And uh, we only got our first golden uh with Trixie, I guess that's now um, maybe 25 years ago or 20, yeah, about 25 years. And uh, uh, we now have our third. And uh, and each one is as different in personality as any human being is different from another. And that they're all got these, these wonderful traits that dogs have that I wish more humans had. And... Uh, <laughs> And uh, I can't imagine life without a, a dog. It's just she's become such. This one is each one becomes such a part of your life that uh, uh, she makes me laugh all day. All, not all day. I don't settle around cackling like the Joker, but uh, <laughs> she she makes me laugh many times during the day and lifts my spirit. So dogs are fundamental anymore in my life. Yeah, I have uh, three small dogs, and yeah, I can't imagine living without a dog. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you're an early adopter of technology. I've noticed. I've noticed this. You even uh, you had your own podcast back in 2006, um, and technology is uh, so important in your books. Uh, you have text messages and the dark web and stuff like that. So how has technology in novels and in your life surprised you since you started writing in the late 60s? You know, certain things you can't have have imagined. It's strange, though. Uh, I think it was the second or third novel I wrote was a paperback science fiction novel. And I keep it out of print now because I don't recommend that it's any good. But but the central premise of it, although I didn't use this term, was virtual reality. And the world becomes almost enslaved by living within a false reality. And uh, so it's fascinating to see something like that coming to pass. When I was starting the Jane Hawk series, uh, I'd become so interested in technology and where it was going. And I was reading novels in which characters were off the grid, supposedly. But I could see in every case that the character wasn't off the grid. And even I could have probably found the character if I'd had the, you know, the right equipment and the time. So I, it got me to thinking, how would somebody really stay off of the grid and yet function in society, especially if she was the most wanted fugitive in the United States with the entire government looking for her? And that was the challenge initially in those stories. And uh, it forced me to learn a lot more about surveillance technology than I had known and to dwell a lot on how you would foil it. Uh, so she, I get fan mail that says, boy, Jane is so clever. That thing she did in that book that where the cop stops her and she ends up getting the best of him or this or that. She's just amazing. And I said, yeah, she is. She thinks of these things in one minute on the spur of the crisis. And it takes me three days sitting in the office brooding to come up with it. So if I had to do it in the field, I'd be dead. Uh, but that's the leisure of being the writer instead of the character. And I find this so interesting, too. It says um, you actually had a collection of short stories published in 1995. What, what feels different about writing Nameless now with comparison to back in 95? Uh, most of those, all those stories published in 95 were written over the probably 15 years before that. Uh, and I would say I've, yeah, as you should, after all these years, I'm better at writing shorter form than I was then. So, and, and I, I had a different attitude about shorter form then. It was, it was something you did because you did it, but it was not as important as the novels. And ultimately, 
I came to love writing novelettes and uh, the shorter form so much that I started tra- taking them as seriously as a novel. Uh, uh, I wrote uh, something called The Moonlit Mind, which uh, I was as imaginative in my mind as any novel. And then I wrote a couple of novelettes with a character who relates to a character in the novel, Ashley Bell. And I was putting as much into those as I was into a novel in terms of intensity of effort. And uh, that, I think, makes a difference between what would have been in that collection and what I'm doing now. Before I let you go, I was kind of curious if, um, for aspiring writers who are listening to this interview, um, if you have would have any advice for them, especially with all the changes that have been occurring in publishing in the last few years. Yeah, it's it's challenging. It's not as easy to break in as it used to be. You would think it w- would be because of Kindle and because of uh, the ability to more easily self-publish, and if you've got what it takes, be recognized for that. But in my estimation, publishers have not done a good job, uh, mainstream publishers, of adapting to the new world. They still still want to do things in a way they've always been done before. And it's uh, it's going to take some, uh, for instance, letting the paperback business sort of die on them, uh, I think was their greatest mistake. Uh, and then insisting on pricing ebooks at the level of trade paperbacks was another mistake. They should price them at the level of, of paperbacks because that's the market they're replacing. Uh, so all of these things have have made it harder on writers to break in. But the opportunities are still there, and it still comes down to the quality of storytelling and the, the, the how exciting the idea might be. And... I think I've always said this, and I think it's no less true and maybe more so, that uh, if somebody looks at a, a career like mine, for instance, and thinks, oh, what a smooth experience that must have been. Uh, but the fact is, I was writing for about 17 years uh, and a lot of books before I ever hit the bestseller list. And then after I hit it, I was not welcomed with open arms by publishers. There were arguments that I've written about this. When when Strangers and Watchers hit the hardcover list, I delivered lightning, and my publisher didn't want to publish it, told me to put it on the shelf for uh, seven years, because if I published it, it would destroy my growing career. And there were all kind of reasons why this was supposedly the case, but I didn't think they were true. I just thought they were just old thinking. Uh, For instance, uh, I was told because the lead of Lightning is a child for the first quarter of the book, that makes it a young adult novel. Well, no. uh, Oliver Twist is a child throughout the novel, and it doesn't make it a young adult novel. Uh, So there were all these common wisdoms in publishing that weren't really wisdom. And uh, I forced the publication of it, and it became the. It would have been number one if they had kept reprinting it like they should have. But we went to number three and did very well with it. Um, and then the next book was Midnight, and it was the first time I hit number one. And my publisher called me up and said, "I've got great news because uh, you learn you're going to be number one on the list about ten days before because they print the book review section a week ahead of the paper." And um, I said, uh, wh- I didn't know what she meant. She said, you're going to be number one on the New York Times. Before I could even whoop with joy, she said, but don't get excited. This will never happen to you again. Oh, my because gosh. <laughs> you don't write the kind of books that can be uh, number one bestsellers. And we had five more number ones in a row, or five, four more number ones in a row. And my publisher every time told me, this will be the last one of these you had. And at that point, I said, you know what? I have to get some place where they think this could happen again. And so it never was as smooth from within as it probably appeared from without. So my best advice to writers is never lose faith in your own work. You have to just persevere. You have to be able to take criticism and understand when it's right and discern when it isn't. Uh, but, and you have to be humble about that. But other than that, 
you're, when all the setbacks happen, as inevitably they will, there are writers that, boom, they're there and nothing ever seems to go wrong. But in my experience, that's not the normal pathway. And uh, so perseverance, determination is more important almost than anything else except talent. Wow, great. Well, thank you so much uh, for uh, being on the podcast and for talking to us. I uh, really appreciate it. It was a real uh, pleasure to, uh, talking with you. That was same here. And I uh, hope you have a great day. Uh, thank you. You too. Take care. Bye. Okay, bye. Thanks once again to Dean Kuntz for being on the podcast. And just a reminder that his latest project, Nameless, is available uh, today, Tuesday, November 12th, 2019. It's his riveting collection of short stories about a vigilante nomad uh, stripped of his memories and commissioned to kill. I've read the first one, In the Heart of the Fire. Uh, highly enjoyed it. It's a great thriller. All six will be available right away on November 12th on Amazon. And if you're a Kindle Unlimited member, uh, you get to read them for free. The audiobook will also be available right away on the 12th. So go check it out at uh, thrillingreads.com forward slash nameless. And go check out uh, Dean's website over at deankunz.com for more info. If you like listening to this podcast, uh, please take a moment to uh, rate and review it. Uh, wherever it is that you're listening to this or you've subscribed, be it Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or Spotify, uh, please do take a moment to rate and review it. And also do check out my website at alanpeterson.com and thrillerauthors.com. Thanks for listening, and I'll catch you in the next episode.